Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine, and I'm glad to be joining you again today, courtesy of the sponsorship of Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with Tomorrow's Technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, um, we're pleased to bring back uh, one of our favorite guests today. He um, happens to appear on here a lot because he happens to win a lot of our essay contest prizes, which secures him a spot here in podcast land. Um, in fact, uh, today's guest, uh, for two years in a row, placed second prize in the um, CNO Naval History Essay Contest. And the third time was the charm because... In the most recent one, uh, last year, he won first prize, and we were thrilled, of course, as uh, is our want to feature that in the current January-February issue, uh, and this is a very thought-provoking piece, if not sort of slightly alarming piece, where all these uh, CNO essay contests are applied history. What are the lessons of the past that uh, resonate for us today? And this year's prize-winning essay... Um, it's not just the lessons of the past, it's the concrete legacy of the past that may have an um, important impact in the near future. And joining me today to talk about this double-edged sword, and that's the name of his article, is Andrew Blackley. Andy, welcome back. Thanks, Eric. Glad to be here. As you uh, say, well, third see. time's a charm. <laughs> Pardon me? I said, I'm third time a charm. That would, uh... Yeah, third time's a charm. That's right. Yeah, well, I, this is... This is a barn burner of an article, um, especially if you're talking about um, the subject of applied history, uh, because this really um, is tangibly, physically that. And um, it's also somewhat uh, eye opening. Um, so let's I'm going to sort of just get the ball rolling and let you tell this um, account. But um, this very much applies to the um, situation in the Pacific. And it very much applies to the legacy of our last great war in the Pacific. So this is a double-edged sword. And I invite you, Andy, to go ahead and just let her go. Let her roll. Okay, thanks. Well, as you probably re may remember, I I've been working on a, a bi biography of Admiral Raymond Spruance for the Naval Institute Press. So in the course of doing my research for that book, I came across the... Um, a publication that was done uh, that came out of the office of Comanche, the commander in chief of uh, of the U.S. fleet, that uh, Ernest J. King, uh, his office put together a compilation of of battle reports and lessons learned in different uh, in different campaigns. And so, for the uh, campaign uh, that wrapped up uh, Operation uh, uh, Flintlock and Catchpole, these were the operations of the Marshall Islands. Uh, Admiral Nimitz, Chester uh, W. Nimitz, was the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii, and uh, he deviated from the usual tactical lessons that were included in these um, in these write-ups and and went into the strategic. And what caught my eye was that he was talking about things that might happen uh, in the future, and we'll get into that a little more deeply. But he basically his theme was that we're capturing these bases now. There's no question that we're going to. He had no question in his mind that we we're going to win the war. Uh, what was going to happen after the post-war? What was going to happen with these bases after we've had them? What degree would we occupy and defend them in the future? And then could they uh, be turned around and used against us at some future time? So even in uh, early 1944, we have uh, Nimitz thinking strategically about uh, the future of, of these installations, of these bases spread throughout the, uh, mostly through the Central Pacific. So that's what that's how I found this thing. It just got me thinking about about what he was talking about, and I did some more research on that. And, it, and as you say, it really turned out to be, I think, quite a, a prescient and and applicable um, subject for for the for the essay contest. So, uh, just the background, as as most of your uh, listeners uh, and readers probably already know, you know, we um, acquired uh, bases, I should say, colonies in the Pacific uh, after, almost as a second thought after the, the uh, Spanish-American War. Uh, we had a choice of leaving the Philippines, in which case it looked like the Empire of Germany was going to come in and take them over 
uh, if we did not stay there and occupy them. Uh, we also received Guam and some other Spanish-owned uh, islands uh, in the Northern Pacific. So automatically that put us sort of athwart the uh, line of advance that uh, planners in Japan were seeing as their, especially naval planners in Japan, who saw Japan's future expanding out into the Pacific Ocean. There's sort of a dichotomy between the Japanese Army and the Japanese Navy. The Japanese Army saw Korea and China, Manchuria, as their, uh, as their area to expand into. And as you could imagine why, the Navy thought, well, we're going to be expanding into the ocean. So this put us into some conflict with Japan. And as you think about that, in the aftermath of the uh, going all the way back to 1905, the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese emerge as a predominant naval power in the Western Pacific. Uh, most of the other Western countries there have small, uh, they call it the China Station, the Asiatic uh, Squadron, small naval uh, units there, but nothing that could match certainly the expertise of the Japanese at that time. They were probably the best practitioners of long range uh, naval gunfire in the world at that, at that point. So U.S. planners started putting together what they called War Plan Orange. If we were to have a war with Japan, how would we go about prosecuting that war? And and the idea is that we would have to bring uh, our fleet coming from uh, the Western United States, and at this time the Panama Canal wasn't even completed yet. Um, we'd have to sail from the continental United States across the Pacific to defend uh, our holdings in the Western Pacific. And to do that, they recognized pretty quickly they would need intermediate bases. Um, not so much for coal because they were starting to convert to oil-fired boilers, but even still, they would need to have places to uh, have anchorage um, coming across the Pacific, so they'd have places to to uh, to refuel uh, the ships, and and uh, and and if they had to go back and do repair before they having to go all the way back to the to the West Coast. So the concept of advanced bases became extremely important. And after the First World War, so let's go back to the First World War just a second. Very important thing happened there. The Japanese came in as allies. They were already had signed a, an alliance with the British in the early 1900s. And as part of that commitment, they um, helped themselves to German possessions in the Central Pacific. So these became, uh, in the, after the League of Nations was established, the mandates in the Central Pacific. Uh, the Caroline Islands, um, the Marshall Islands particularly, these were uh, previously held by Germany. Now the Japanese had them. And that gave them a, a defensive perimeter uh, for, for use against uh, the, uh, any attempt by the U.S. fleet to make inroads into the Western Pacific. So in 1921, a uh, Marine major, uh, Pete Ellis, um, very un interesting character, but he actually went and, and reconnoitered uh, some of the Marshall Islands and wrote a, a tentative uh, manual for uh, advanced space operations, which became really the basis for all the uh, Marine Corps' uh, future work and the idea of seizing uh, advanced bases in the, in the Pacific. And he did a lot of original thinking on it, the need for offshore gunfire, the need even for uh, aerial support, uh, the importance of being able to defend an island once you've seized it, and, and so on. So he was very uh, prescient as, as well in his own right. Unfortunately, he died under somewhat mysterious circumstances while he was doing his sort of cloak and dagger work out there uh, in the Central Pacific. But nevertheless, the Marine Corps picked up on this and they kept developing, developing this concept uh, into the 1930s. And so we find ourselves then, you know, at the beginning of the, of the Second World War, uh, the Japanese have, have done a very masterful campaign of neutralizing the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor uh, by destroying the battleships. Fortunately, our carriers are out doing uh, other things, reinforcing Wake Island and, uh, and other operations. And so they were not caught at Pearl Harbor. But they did, the Japanese did go on to destroy our Asiatic fleet, uh, the Dutch fleet, uh, British units, uh, particularly the Prince of Wales um, off, the coast of, uh, off the coast of Malaysia. They overran Singapore, they overran the Philippine Islands, uh, and were threatening um, to potentially invade Australia. So we had this conundrum in the early, early 1942 of how best to deal with the Japanese fleet. Even 
at the time, there were proponents like King in particular wanted to see some action. Uh, uh, and even Kimmel, uh, before Pearl Harbor, had plans to enact elements of War Plan Orange to, uh, to have the U.S. Navy uh, start crossing the Central Pacific. Well, in 42, there was no way that was going to happen. Uh, our carriers were in bad condition, and, and we lost more during the battles around the Solomon Coral and Coral Sea and, uh, and at Midway, of course. The other two battles stopped the Japanese advance. Uh, then we slugged it out in the, in the Solomon Islands for six months or more uh, in a war of attrition. Uh, but early in 1943, the U.S. Navy was in no position to do any major offensive operations. They really had to wait until the um, until the industrial uh, power of the United States could come to bear. Fortunately, uh, the the um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his administration had been working with Carl Vinson and others uh, who were concerned about the weakness of our Navy to see that we were at a ship construction program in 1934, 1938, and again in 1940, where we had major elements, especially the big fast carriers and fast battleships were being laid down, uh, but they would not be ready uh, until, until really until mid-1943. And so that got... Uh, when all these forces were collected in, in uh, early and, and uh, middle of 1943, the U.S. started putting together its, its strategy for how we would go across the Central Pacific. And again, they were using um, the Marine Corps uh, advanced base um, concepts combined with now the fast carriers and the, with the fast battleships uh, to prevent a very fast striking force. Um, Admiral Nimitz and his staff, uh, and in particular Raymond Spruance, now had been assigned to be the commander of the Central Pacific Force, which eventually became the Fifth Fleet. Uh, they put together the strategy for seizing islands in the Central Pacific. So first, uh, they took the Gilbert Islands. The Gilberts had not been a mandate island, they a mandated area that had actually been a British possession, but it was. We really knew nothing about what was going on in the mandates because the Japanese made sure that. Uh, no one could get in and out of there to see what they were doing. I mean, there's the, these conspiracy theories that Amelia Earhart was there trying to figure out what was going on, and the Japanese captured her and did something to her. That's None of that is proven, but it, she was, in fact, flying on the edge of the mandate area. Uh, so there was very little intelligence about the mandates, uh, other than what we could glean from having submarines uh, look at things at Periscope, uh, you know, depth out, you know, out in the, at the edge of the lagoon. Um, so it was deemed imperative that we we take uh, the Tarawa Atoll and, and uh, Bahio Island, which uh, became the bat known as the Battle of Tarawa, so that we could establish a base at that point to do further reconnaissance and provide ourselves with a base of operations. Now, as you know, in, in, you, had a, you had an issue back in October in the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Tarawa, about how terrible that was and the heavy losses we encountered there. Uh, the Japanese had been um, uh, reinforcing that island. Uh, they pretty much jammed in about as many troops as you could fit into that small area, uh, and they had been building up their defenses. So we, we learned some hard lessons there about how long we had to do offshore bombardment, the, necess the necessity for having uh, land-based aircraft attack these islands uh, from other bases, just kind of soften them up. So all these elements were coming together um, in what uh, Spruance considered to be, you know, his his uh, philosophy was to, to strike hard with the maximum amount of firepower that he could bring in into a concentrated area and then get out quickly. The one thing that they were afraid of were the uh, possibility that Japanese um, submarines could could infiltrate and, and sink uh, part of the invasion fleet, which in fact they did with Liscombe Bay uh, with a very tragic uh, uh, event there. Um, so they, he was very concerned about getting getting in and out as fast as possible. So after Tarawa, with lessons learned, uh, they spend a whole month or more uh, flying from the bases they recently captured to, to bomb um, in the Marshall Islands, uh, Kwajalein Atoll and Enuiktaq Atoll, and some of the other Japanese uh, associated bases, Mili and Daluit, uh, Wochi, these other uh, atolls that surrounded the area, uh, they would try to neutralize those and then come in uh, with a landing. And 
I should also mention at the same time that because in the South Pacific, the, the work that Halsey and other people were doing had destroyed a lot of the Japanese cruiser strength, the Japanese high command felt that it would be too dangerous to confront the American fleet uh, somewhere in the Central Pacific at this point without enough um, without without enough uh, screens, to, to destroyers and cruisers for their carriers. So they sort of held back at both uh, the Gilbert Islands and then at Marshall Islands. They really didn't show up for the battle. We 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 were there pretty much in strength uh, with large numbers of carriers and battleships, and were able to to execute landings at uh, first at Kwajalein and Roy Namur, which is uh, something that's mentioned in the article. These are existing, we still hold uh, Kwajalein and Roy Namur uh, as bases. In fact, there was an article or something in uh, the USI News of, about a couple of weeks ago, there was a freak uh, wave came up uh, on Roy Namur and uh, inundated uh, some of the, our facilities there on the island. So we still have some presence there. Uh, but just goes to show that uh, you know the 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 vulnerability of these islands to natural events as well as man-made events. So the point of that being that the the with based on lessons learned, we were able to capture Kwajalein Atoll and Anuitak Atoll with relatively small losses, and we did it very quickly. And it placed us in a very strategic spot in the Marshall Islands inside uh, the Japanese defensive perimeter. Uh, Japan's concept for defeating the United States involved uh, engaging the U.S. fleet in decisive battle. Now, they were still very Mahanian minded that in order to win a war, or at least in, in order to force the United States to come to the negotiating table, they would have to destroy the U.S. fleet. And to do that, they would first entice the fleet to come through these island chains where they would, through attrition from land-based aircraft and submarines, uh, sink U.S. ships and and get it to the point where uh, where the two fleets would be on parity. As you will recall, the Washington Naval Treaty set the Japanese naval strength at 60 percent of the U.S. naval strength. So the Japanese always felt that um, they got a raw deal there, and that they would, in order to meet the U.S. on equal strength, they would have to do a lot to um, to pare down the U.S. fleet through attrition. So that was their that was their strategy. Uh, and to help do this, they established this system of interlocking defensive bases spread all throughout uh, the Southwest Pacific, uh, the Central Pacific, and, and even into the Northern Pacific. They even considered the Aleutian Islands to be potentially part of that. Uh, so their idea was that it'd have this defensive zone set up with overlapping perimeters uh, within uh, flying distance of land-based aircraft uh, so that they could have uh, land-based aircraft on these islands that would then attack any any incoming U.S. fleet. The problem from then is that for them, and as it is for us today, is that there are just so many of these islands. Uh, where do you start defending them? And that was really a big problem for them. They they kind of spread. They did in fact spread themselves fairly thin. The Japanese Navy and the and the Japanese Army could never really agree very much on on war strategy. Uh, the Japanese Army was very reluctant to provide troops to garrison these islands. They only did so later on uh, at uh, Saipan and Tinian, uh, just because they really had no choice at that point. But uh, the, the Japanese Navy was struggling for manpower uh, to defend all these island bases. Uh, whereas we were going from strength to strength. Every month saw new ships come into the theater, more and more men being recruited. Uh, an important thing, we have more technicians than the Japanese did. There's a great book uh, recently by Mr. Fisher, uh, Stan Fisher, on, you know, maintaining the carriers. Uh, you needed to have a, enough uh, technical support uh, on these on aircraft carriers. And that's, it's one thing to build aircraft. You need to have people to fly them and maintain them. And we had a better, a superior system for both training pilots, for getting, for keeping them rested uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, rotating them back for R&R. &R. Uh, and then we had, as I say, this great system of, of maintaining uh, the aircraft. And in fact, we had so many aircraft that it got to the point where uh, it was more economical just to throw them overboard and bring up a new one than try to, and try to take time to fix, fix something that was battle damaged. So that's the kind of riches that we had to deal with uh, compared to the Japanese. So after all this, as I say at the beginning of this, um, 
during or should at in the aftermath of every, every one of these operations, all the battle reports from every level were, were collected from all the uh, individual skippers of everything down to landing craft and LSTs to destroyers, all the way up to the task group commanders, the, the admirals and rear admirals, um, put together their thoughts on, on the operation and how things can be improved. And generally their thoughts were very tactically minded. They, you know, we should have, we need better uh, identification fender foe on our aircraft. We need uh, night fighters. We need, you know, this, that, or the other thing, but very much limited to thinking about the tactics uh, for the next operation. And what caught my eye was that Nimitz then looked at the strategic picture. He was looking at what was gonna go on uh, in the future. And he was really providing a warning explicitly for the younger officers who were reading those reports uh, and to learn something and to think so that they would think about in the future, how you could defend uh, what it could be termed as an unsinkable aircraft carrier. And as he pointed out uh, in, in what he wrote, that, um, he, that, the, that it would take a lot to, you could destroy the, the above ground infrastructure of an air base, the hangars, the fueling depots and so on, uh, but you really could not destroy the hard stand, the runways. So that was the hardest thing to build uh, in, a, in an air base. Um, as you know, I, I think you know that I, I'm a retired civil engineer, so I have a lot of experience in, in the importance of, of clearing and leveling areas for new construction and new roadways. And, and, and working off a solid base is the most important thing you can have in building a, either a roadway or, or, or a runway. And that's the hardest thing to do. So all these islands in the in the Central Pacific have had a lot of their hard work has already been done. They've been cleared, uh, the, the areas have been compacted. Um, and what caught me as I started looking, going, going back and looking just in Google Earth at all these little uh, former island bases spread throughout the Central Pacific was that most of them still had active airports on them and some even large international airports. And even places that didn't have any active airport, they had a little grass strip that was built right on top or still being used on top of an old abandoned runway, either built by us or the Japanese, and that they have local flights fly in and out of there. Um, and even on the most desolate islands like Howland Island, there's enough of a strip there that within a couple of days of some brush clearing, you probably can make it uh, usable by a, a C-130 or a VSOL aircraft. So the, the fact is that a lot of these, uh, these old bases that were built up uh, during the war are still available for use today. And so that's- Oh, yeah, as that, you point out that, in, in, in your article, it's like the roads of ancient Rome. They were um, a good avenue of attack and expansion for Rome, but they're also a two-way street. And they're also the very way you can turn around and attack Rome. These, um, um, what, what are they called? Unsinkable aircraft carriers? Is that the term right. they came up with? Yes. Yeah, these islands that are unsinkable aircraft carriers, these multitudinous airstrips all through that region, as you point out, are a two-way street. Just as they were our um, avenue of advance, they can be the avenue of someone else's advance coming toward our direction. The fact there's so many of them there is kind of um, surprising and um, kind of alarming, too. Now you point out something in there that especially um, stood out for me is that if China is thinking about this, well, I think it's clear they are because of something you point out. What is one way that they are trying to make inroads into these uh, Central Pacific, as we call them, legacy bases that proliferate there? Um, in terms of, there's, they're making some diplomatic outreaches, very, very targeted diplomatic outreaches, are they not? Yes, they are. I mean, they, I don't. They have not sent any naval units that I'm aware of uh, to these areas, but they are, in fact, using their financial resources uh, and providing foreign aid and loans. I mean, this is their technique they're using all throughout uh, Southeast Asia uh, and Africa as part of their Belt and Braces um, uh, policy of of uh, on one hand giving you for giving money to build infrastructure uh, with the proviso that, oh, by the way, if we ever need to use it, uh, we're going to have the ability to do so. Um, so they're doing that in, in, uh, the, in, the, 
in the Federated Islands of Micronesia, which are not technically allied with, with anyone. Uh, they're, they're neutral. And they control a lot of the Caroline Islands, uh, what used to be called Truk, is now Chuk. Uh, this, is, this was so-called the so-called Gibraltar of the Pacific, where the Japanese had their major naval base. Um, and uh, they're there working today. They're building, financing uh, airport construction there and, uh, and, on, and on other islands. Um, just recently, the island of Nauru, which is actually south and, and west of, of this area, sort of in the, on the edge of the Northern Solomons. This was an island that had been considered for invasion uh, early on in, in 1943, but Spruance and, and uh, Holland Smith uh, pointed out that, that it would be, it would be like, it would have been extremely difficult to invade just because of uh, there were hardly any beaches on it and so on. It was a phosphate, it was, was a phosphate mine. Uh, that's why the New, New Zealanders were running phosphate mining out of there. I don't think they're mining anymore, but that could be something that the, the Chinese would be more than happy to reopen. I mean, so there are tons of, ton, there are literally, you know, a large amount of natural resources that China could potentially exploit and for peaceful purposes, at least from, from, from their standpoint. They were, were, you know, we're gonna provide you with foreign aid. We want the ability to come in with our fishing fleets, fish the waters, we want to do uh, exploration for, for uh, strategic minerals uh, and so on. And so they're doing coming in under in, in, in um, perfectly peaceful operations, but they could have, you know, as other people have done before them, you come in with on one hand and say, I'm going to give you this aid and the other. And we do the same thing. Realistically, we do the same thing with, with people that we provide aid for. Um, you know, then we want to have the ability to come back and and uh, and and have access to these areas later on. So, one of the ideas that I that I borrow and I didn't come up with it, but the, the concept of the second island cloud uh, right. that we have we talk about the first island chain, and that's usually the the uh, where people concentrate their thoughts on. You know, if China were to invade uh, Taiwan. Which is their stated goal to to either peace of, peaceably or otherwise uh, reunite uh, Taiwan uh, with mainland China, that they would have to go. They would have to deal with the first island chain. So you've got the Ryukyu Islands, Okinawa, uh, Japan itself. These are um, in the Philippines. These are really the first island chain, and it goes back, you know, again to concept. These are not new concepts. They were talking about the first island chain. Back in the First World War, that these were these were areas that that had to be held uh, as a as a defensive barrier. So the second island chain, though, is the are these islands then in the Central Pacific? And again, that anybody who wants to advance into the first island chain, as we wanted to do uh, with Japan, uh, has to go through the Central Pacific. And same thing in the other direction. Uh, the other thing about holding the second island chain is that it could would it would command um, what's going on in the Eastern Pacific. So again, one of the, the major things that the, one of the first things that the U.S. did at the opening of the Second World War was to make, was to ensure that our lifeline, our line of communication between uh, North America and New Zealand, Australia, was remained intact. And the very first things we did were to go and reinforce uh, the Fiji Islands, uh, dealing with French Polynesia establishing bases um, Bora Bora uh, along this this eastern Pacific chain in the South Pacific mostly uh, that we would then have a line of communications between there and and uh, North America so that line then will, would cut off anyone coming from uh, mainland China to have access to you know they're looking at exploiting markets in South and Central Central America um, They've been financing a, a, a replacement for the Panama Canal through Nicaragua. So these are becoming strategic areas for them as well. So they would be looking at this second island chain as an area that they would want to uh, that they would want to control uh, or keep us from controlling, so that we can't cut off their lines of communication. So it becomes, you know, these little bases spread all over the Central Pacific then take on. Uh, a renewed importance. Um, I think we've taken them for granted that we've we've held them for a long, long time. 
Uh, and that we, the idea is that, you know, when we were the predominant uh, Navy until the last 10 years, that nobody else had the wherewithal uh, to have a blue water fleet that could possibly threaten them. But I think today the situation is obviously much different. So that was really the point of the article is that, you know, we have these legacy bases that we built up or the Japanese built up. We didn't take them all. You know, a lot of those bases, we left it, what they called the wither on the vine. A lot of those Japanese garrisons uh, were bypassed and literally starved to death. They were on, they were, you know, the, they're at the end of the war, they were, they were a fraction of their former manpower. What little bit of supply they could get to them had to be done with submarines. And that's not, we don't want to be, we don't want to be one of the things I mentioned in the article. We don't want to be in the position where we're risking, you know, billion dollar, $10 billion submarines trying to reinforce uh, Guam or something like that. I mean, you want to, you don't want to, be like like the Japanese, their submarine force ended up becoming uh, uh, transports and and supply ships for these island garrisons. So the point is that you know you can you can take a f and this is something that that Nimitz also pointed out in his analysis is that we were able to come in with superior firepower, isolate these other other Japanese held bases, take the ones we wanted, and neutralize these other bases and bypass them. We didn't have to expend any manpower in attempting to take them, but the Japanese couldn't come back and, and reinforce them either. So as long as you can control the sea lines of communication, you can prevent uh, the enemy or your adversary from moving in or out of the second island chain. And that, that becomes extremely important, I think. Yeah. Well, it, it's there's a, um, a graph included with your article that um, has a list of all these legacy bases from World War II scattered throughout that second island cloud chain, what have you. It's it's shocking how many of them remain there and uh, are in current active use or can be made to be in active use. I, I would ask you to predict if China put, starts making more and more moves further outward into the second island cloud, ostensibly under perfectly legitimate and peaceful grounds. Um, this is certainly not going to just raise the hackles of the United States, is it? I mean, I would, I can imagine Japan is watching this very closely, as well as other um, partners in the region. Um, what do you think would happen if they start making a bigger push there, China, in terms of, even if it's all like even diplomatic, and but very obvious and um, increasing right. in the amount of it? Well, I think... Um we have some allied partners that I think we need to call on to help uh, sort of, you know, we basically have to go back and do another sort of a charm offensive in this area with, you know, we, people hate to think of this, but we may have to give some foreign aid and, and do some development work in there. And these, you know, um, a lot of these islands are also worried about global warming and what they're, what the impact of uh, sea level rise, however we want to say that the origin of it, the fact is, that sea level rise is a real thing and it has to be dealt with. And that's where they're gonna look, be looking for aid and assistance. Um, so the French still hold Fiji and, and Tahiti and all the beautiful islands in the, in the, in the South Pacific. Uh, the, you know, the AUK US uh, relationship that's been developed here in the last few years will come, I think needs to come to the fore. There's still some British possessions there. Uh, and also, um, you know, the, the the Australians and lesser extent, the New Zealanders have a big interest in making sure that the sea line of communication to uh, North America in particular, is, it remains open. You know, they were, one of the things I quoted in my article, there was um, a retired uh, Australian general was outraged at the idea that the, the Chinese were making inroads into the Solomon Islands and that they were even courting, you know, uh, New Guinea. So these places that had cost so much blood and treasure to the allies in the past, you know, the, the Chinese are just walking in with bags of money and and uh, and gaining um, important intelligence that we had to gain through some pretty hard fighting. I mean, they that's the other thing about these these development that not only do they uh, establish goodwill with the people living there and and diplomatic relations. A number of these islands have recognized uh, China's uh, right to be the the, the only China and, and their uh, sovereignty over Taiwan, but it also gives Chinese technicians the ability to come in and map everything. They'll know, you know, they'll have a lot more information than we ever had on, we were still relay, relying on maps from the, from the late 1800s in some of these islands. 
you know, <laughs> you know, we our charts and things were extremely were extremely old and antique by the time we got around to invading these areas. Well, they'll have, you know, thanks to modern technology, of course, with with uh, satellite technology and everything else, they won't have um, those problems that we did in 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 uh, being able to to come up with accurate charts and, and locations of things and. So they're getting they're getting a lot of technical information that we never had that would definitely facilitate their advance through the area. So, but to answer your question, the way to deal with it is to win, you know, to win back the hearts and minds of the people that are living there. To get them to convince them that um, that uh, they're better off being uh, part of the you know what we're calling the liberal international order, uh, represented by um, by the United States and its and its allies and partners. Rather than um, rather than uh, than communist China, right? Um, in addition to that increased level of outreach, which sounds like a, uh, a prerequisite first step, what are some other things that the United States could be doing to kind of buttress this from happening? Uh, maybe perhaps militarily as well as diplomatically. Well, I think we could. We still hold the islands um, in the Marshall Island chain. We have hold all those old islands that we had we had previously captured. Um, so we hold uh, Majuro, we hold, uh, like I said, Roy Namur, Kwajalein, and well, Anawitak, some of those have been used for atomic testing, so you can't really, they may not be something you want to occupy for very long, but Majuro is a case in point. And, and I, uh, Majuro was one of these atolls that, um, one of uh, Spruance's, uh, his chief of, of staff, a guy by the name of Charles Carl Moore, it was his idea to take uh, Majuro and turn it into a fleet anchorage. And there's a great picture, uh, you know, the Naval His History and Historic Command has a, a beautiful photograph taken the entire fifth fleet uh, at anchor inside Majuro Lagoon. It's, play it's huge. And we had improved that during the war uh, to provide a good anchorage and it still can be used as, an, as a major fleet anchorage today. And the thing about those is that when you're in in a lagoon like that, you're the chance of you're being torpedoed uh, from a lurking submarine is very small. They'd have to get into the lagoon, and that would make them extremely vulnerable. Um, so these these bases that we still hold, I think you know we need to look at them and do some pre-planning about how we're going to use them. Now, the problem, of course, and Nimitz pointed this out as well. Anytime you build a fixed base and you, you locate yourself in one place, it also leaves you vulnerable to attack. So if you could put you know, a billion dollars into a base in the Central Pacific, well, at some point it wouldn't take much to really neutralize it, at least for some period of time. You know, if you're, and these are areas that I'm not cognizant of because I'm just a civilian, I don't have no, no security clearance, so I'm just hypothesizing here, but you know, pace of operations in in a in a blue water war in the western pacific reaching into the into the second island chain may happen so quickly that you, if you can neutralize something for a period of weeks or, or a month or two it would be long enough to to really to to put it out of any, of any use um, in that kind of in that kind of engagement and that gets back to you know the, the current marine um, pivot to the uh, to the uh, uh, the, their advanced, their new advanced space operations um, that uh, they're, they're uh, that they're looking at, and that's something where they're they're looking at placing small light units, easily easily mobile and transportable, that you could locate uh, on a you know quote unquote a desert island someplace, uh, arm them with uh, with uh, short ship uh, anti or anti ship missiles and and drones and things like that, and provide um, a really nasty surprise for any you have to do it in secrecy and they have to be able to uh, they they these are not things that they're going to be able to they're not going to be able to put up the kind of defense that the japanese did on tarawa where they're going to they're not just going to stand there and die they're not going to dig themselves into deep pillboxes and foxholes and fight it out to the last man you need to have them there basically to shoot and scoot that they can locate these islands uh, be familiar with them uh, to determine how they're going to be used and where they're going to be used and when they're going to be used. And then, you know, if, in the event of an actual um, combat operations that they would get in and out of there as uh, quickly as possible. So mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's another 
lesson to be learned. Don't depend too much. Know that these bases are there, but be careful about where you establish a permanent fixture. And right. Guam, for example, is our one of our major bases in, in the on the edge of the Western Pacific, and it is extremely vulnerable right now to long-range Chinese missile salvos. Mm -hmm. There's and so much in the press nowadays um, from the Naval War College and the pages of proceedings, um, you know, future war potential scenarios with China. And, um, you know, you, you hear uh, details about how there's a window of time where they're most likely to do something. So I'm going to ask you now to go out on a limb and pro <laughs> prognosticate um, even further. Uh, if something aggressive were to be planned and were to occur in these waters, what do you see as when that would be? In when it would of, be? Yeah, within the next decade, within the next oh, 15 yeah. years. I know I'm really putting you out on a limb here. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so I was reading something recently and you know, I, I read, of course, I use, read USNI news every day and War on the Rocks and all of, and proceedings, of course. Um, so, you know, I know a little bit, you know, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, right? So, I mean, I'm not, a, I have no access to classified information or, or reports or anything of that nature. So I only know what I can, what I read and what's available, uh, you know, to, in, in, uh, in the public domain. So, but that's convinced me, and I have read some white papers that were produced that the Chinese have published for, for public, uh, consumption. And I, I'm pretty of the pretty much of the opinion that uh, Xi Jinping uh, sees himself as as the great um, I don't want to say emperor, but uh, he's he's the guy that's going to reestablish China. Uh, he's going to end this the hundred years of shame and the and the decline of the Chi that the Chinese Empire has undergone uh, in the last 150 years at the hands of uh, at the hands of the West. And he's going to do that. First off, he's got to reacquire, and he's made it a goal. And it's almost to the point where it becomes a sort of thing that if you don't do it, it's going to threaten the um, the credibility of the regime and the communist uh, party's hold on China if he if they fail to take Taiwan. Now, of course, you know the totalitarian regimes can always move the goalposts around and say, you know, it's sort of like 1984 where you know, victory is peace and so on and so forth. They can always redefine what their war goals are going to be and claim that they won the war anyhow. But the the, the thing is that I think, um, and looking again at, at declining Chinese demographics, um, that potentially in the next 10 years and probably uh, closer to the end of five years, that that they may try to do something. And I fervently hope that that's that we can build up a deterrence. And that's the whole point of these art. This article is that is we need to have a we need to have strength uh, in place and a credible deterrence so that these sorts of things can't happen. That he will conclude that uh, an attempted cross straight invasion of Formo uh, Taiwan, excuse me, Formosa, or formerly Formosa. Uh, would be just too uh, too expensive uh, for the people to tolerate. But you know they can. If you lie to your people about what's going on, you can you can probably uh, like the Russians do. You can absorb a hell of a lot of losses before anyone's the wiser. So yeah, it's it's yeah it's um it's disconcerting to think about. Yes, uh, it is. But if there's one little ray of um, optimism. In what you just laid out there, it's the fact that if we were to succeed with our partners in creating enough of a wall of deterrence, if you will, um, none of this has to happen like it's looking like it may happen now. And I'll close with the um, age old saying that the future is unwritten and uh, we can have the power to steer the course of which way it's going to go and hopefully right. we make the right choices. But when you look back at how these tangible legacies of the Pacific War, uh, these place names that always appear in naval history and how in just a few years it could be reappearing in proceedings in the front pages of newspapers again, uh, it just reminds you that we're 
the future is inextricably intertwined with the past and the legacy of the past. In this case, quite literally, the legacy bases of World War II and the Pacific, the Central Pacific. I urge everybody who reads Naval History, if you haven't yet, to read this article. It is an eye-opener. It's very um, thought-provoking, to say the least. Um, we have a letter to the editor going in the next issue, Andy, about how this uh, article is... Um, causing some <laughs> alarm among certain readers. You know, it's, it's, it's one more thing to stay up at night worrying about. Right? <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you so much for bringing this, this to uh, the attention of the public with this article. I mean, this is uh, one of the most uh, prescient and um, hard hitting of the essay contest winners in my time here. And I congratulate you on your well-deserved victory. Thank you. you know, I'm a life member of the Navy, U.S. Naval Institute, and of course, I would highly, highly recommend anyone listening to become a, a member, if not a life member. And I, I absolutely, even though I was never serving uh, in the in the military, I, I absolutely, um, you know, support the U.S. Navy, the Sea Services, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard in what they do. And I hope that my scribblings, uh, if they make people think a little bit about something, um, I will be highly gratified. Well, I think they're doing that, so you should be. And I will let everyone know that was an unsolicited plug to become a member, but he's right. You should. Um, well, Andy, it's always a pleasure to have you on here, and uh, I'm Thank sure you. we'll have you on here again soon. Um, right. um, we look forward to having you in the pages of the magazine again as well. Yes, sir. Um, I thanks again it. for joining us, and um, we'll talk to you very soon, I'm sure. Okay. That's it for today, folks. Um, thanks for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings podcast. Until next time. Fare thee well.